So let's go ahead and take your Bibles, open up to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. There's no paragraph delineations here. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but I'll start in verse 19. Psalm 78, verse 19. Yea, they speak against God. They say, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food and he sent meat to the full and he caused, he caused an east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he brought in the south wind he rained flesh upon them as dust, and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the, in the midst of their camp, round about their habitations. So they did eat and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was in yet their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this they, they sinned still, believed not and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they sought him and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouths and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. We'll stop there and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the, the time that we can spend together in your word. Thank you for the time together in prayer. And we pray that we would gain some things here tonight that would be beneficial and fruitful uh, to us spiritually. And uh, we can learn from, from Israel and their disobedience. We know 1 Corinthians 10 tells us a great deal about that. And, and, and not go the directions of, of experience. Uh, your word should be the, the deciding factor uh, we don't have anything to prove by having to go through sinful things. We can learn from you not to do those things. And so we just ask you to speak to our hearts here tonight, uh, not only those that are here, those who uh, may be watching as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the early days of uh, my learning to drive, I had to learn with a stick shift. Uh, not too many people in our day had automatic. They came out later, but most everybody had stick shift. Uh, there was a four speed uh, with reverse, and then it eventually made its way to five speed. And the lower gears were pretty easy, and if you didn't have it explained to you, then the, the three and four uh, allowed you to uh, Cruise at speeds, speeds unattainable, unattainable in first and second. And the same thing with fifth gear. 
when they, when it came out. But there were there were times when uh, I questioned why I had to use the fourth and fifth gear, um, why they were necessary. After all, it was kind of nice to hear the engine uh, and the tachometer just going up and going higher and higher, even though you know it uh, was not designed for that. Now I know <laughs> that it was dumb, and I was a dumb teenager. Uh, but that was the time when everything was being questioned. And I mean everything. And being a lost kid probably didn't help either. So that thinking process of mine, what I was doing, I was limiting the, the ability of the car to perform the way it was designed to perform. I mean, those, those gears were all there for a reason. They were not to be used uh, to play with. Uh, there were some people, including myself, that knew how to downshift and let it run out and turn off the ignition and blow the muffler. Uh, I had a tough time explaining that to my dad. I said, oh, we must have run over a rock or something. But it, it seemed to work, and every, so did the other kids, because everybody tried it. So uh, I'm going to switch gears. I've known s professing saved people to question, why do I have to read the Bible at all? You know, I mean, you do it there in church, why do I have to read it? Uh, why, should they, why should they pray? Uh, why should they attend church? Uh, why should they be loyal to the church that they go to? Why can't you go to all different kinds of churches? You know, why is one special to the other? Uh, and then why even witness? I mean, I, I, if you haven't met them, uh, you're fortunate, but uh, really, they're out there. And so with her, without knowing it, uh, they were stifling their spiritual growth. They were limiting the Lord and remaining babies, babies in Christ if they were saved at all. Uh, we had people over the years they came to church and knew, professed that they were saved and knew nothing about the Bible, nothing, uh, you know. And, uh, and so they were babies in Christ. You would hope that you would, you know, help them to grow. Psalm 70, in Psalm 78, Asap uh, outlines a relationship with himself and the, and the Israelites. Most of it was not good. It, most everything you read there uh, with me was not good, Desp despite what the Lord had repeatedly done for and with them. They, it was disobedience after disobedience. They were defiant in their disobedience. And, and so uh, verse 41 bring, really brings us to the, to the message. They, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. So if we were to develop that into the New Testament, yea, they turned back, that would be like, like saying, I think I liked it better when I was lost. I think I liked it better when I was going to hell. I like that far better because I didn't, I didn't feel any guilt. I didn't feel anything. It was just a good time. Uh, here the, the Israelites were redeemed from Egypt and remembered, wasn't it? I think it was 45 days after they were out of the, delivered from Egypt, they wondered, why, why, did, why did we come out here at all? We should go back. You know, this was all new. It was a change. So the message tonight is putting limitations on God. And so go with me to Job. There's a lot of verses we're going to go to tonight. Not too many points. But I don't discuss points. I just go to them. So Job chapter 13 the one thing that we, we have to understand, and I'm sure we do, if you don't, and you think you're invincible, uh, you're in for a, a sad, painful life. Uh, so, number, human limitations exist. Job chapter 13, and look here in verse 27. Job is speaking. 
He says, Thou puttest my feet also in the stocks, and lookest narrowly unto all my paths. Thou settest a print upon the heels of my feet. So Job's acknowledging that God has taken him and put him in the stocks. The stocks were very painful. But he was, I mean, he was severely limited. In Psalm chapter 90, let's go there, Psalm chapter 90, we learn about, about time and age. And this is a Psalm of Moses. And we read in verse 10, or verse 9, Psalm 90, verse 9. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be, they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. The days of our lives are numbered. Uh, you don't know the number, God knows the number. Um, Many people don't make it past 60 or 70. And, uh, and some, of course, have made it to 80. And we're finding that there's a little bit more shortcomings. Uh, but there's severe limitations that we didn't have maybe 20 years ago. Um, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm just discussing the limitations that are put on us as human beings. Matthew chapter five. Let me get there. And let's look down here in verse 20, 20, 36, I'm sorry, 536. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Now, today, you could be funny and say, oh, I can change my hair color anything I want. But the Lord is saying, you have great limitations naturally. You cannot do that. God can do it, but you can't. And then in chapter 5, Look in verse, uh, oh, that is five, six, chapter six, verse 37, 27, 6, 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit into a stature? Anybody here just think your way into adding an inch to your life, your height? No, you can't. So listen then, God's wise purposes are often stressed, frustrated by his own people. There are many things God wants to do for man, if permitted, but cannot, because man puts limitations on God. So we'll look at a few. Here's the first one. Inconsistent Christian living handicaps God. One. In other words, you can be one way here and another way out of here. And that inconsistency limits God, what God can do with you and bless you. It's just a, a natural result. In Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59. I'm trying to keep these all together even though I know I'm jumping around. Isaiah 59, and look here in verse two. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So iniquities, as a saved person, separate us from fellowship with him if they're not taken care of. And in Jeremiah chapter five, Jeremiah chapter 5, and we're kind of bundling these together. Look at verse 25. 
Jeremiah 5.25, your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholden good things from you. So based on that, go to 1 John chapter 1. There's an explanation that needs to be taken care of here. 1 John chapter 1. So in, in Isaiah 59 and Jeremiah 5, both of them saying the same thing, that sin separates you as a sa an unsaved person from God. Of course, you need to be saved. Saved people can be separated from fellowship with God because of sin unconfessed. And you have to deal with the specific sin. Look at verse 9, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Christian life is a life of growth. It's continual growth, it's not stagnation. And so you're growing and growing and as you're growing, you're in fellowship with, Christ, with the Lord and suddenly there's sin and you don't take care of it. And then you think I'm still walking forward. No, you're stuck, you're stuck, you're stagnant. You're right there, you're stopped. And you can call on him and call on him and call on him. And you can deceive yourself and think he's listening. No, he's not. Because there's unconfessed sin. And so you have to deal with that. And so here you are at this place. And finally you realize I'm not dealing with the sin in my life. And so you, you begin to confess that to him. And when you do, you notice that he is faithful to what forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All right, that puts you back into fellowship. But your growth should have been maybe here or here or here. And you're not where you should be. And so now you have to pay particular attention to what you're doing so that you can, you're not gonna catch up. You just have to keep growing. But there are people that have stifled God for a long time and limited him and they're out of fellowship and they make up things and they get in churches that it may help them make up things and aid them in making up things. And they think they're right when they're not right. Unless the sin is dealt with specifically, you're wasting your time. So we as saved people put severe limitations on our fellowship if we don't make things right with the Lord. One of the problems is we don't like to look at what, what God calls sin. And we kind of debate that and argue that with God and sometimes with somebody else. Oh, that can't, he shouldn't, surely couldn't mean that. Well, yes, he can. And you need to know what the word of God says concerning sin. All right, number two, in Matthew 13, Matthew chapter two, lack of faith limits his deity. Since this is something that in my estimation is severely underestimated. Matthew chapter 13, and let's look at Verse 58, Jesus is at Nazareth and he makes this statement, or he didn't, but the statement is made and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. If you go to Mark 5, I think it is, uh, it tells you the whole story with the Lord in the synagogue and I think he healed somebody and he couldn't do anything else. And the statement was made, they couldn't do it because they wouldn't believe. They wouldn't believe who he was. And here's an instance where the lack of faith limits the deity of, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ altogether. Matthew 17, Matthew 17. And look here in verse 20. Same subject. Verse 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, 
Why could we not cast him out? You know the story about that one. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Faith as a grain of mustard seed. How, does anybody know how small a mustard seed is? It is tiny, 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 and and it grows, and it grows. You would look and say, "Wow, that is that came from that." If we had if we had that much faith as a mustard seed, you know what you know what he's saying? Your faith is virtually non-existent because if you had that kind of faith. You could do things that nothing would, have, would hold you back. Nothing would be impossible. I don't know that any of us can realize that. But we certainly can do better than a seed of a mustard. That's a, a, a little sample. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And begin reading in verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed <clears throat> upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And it entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Most people are afraid to venture out from where they are spiritually. They like, they're, they're content, they're complacent, they're I, I don't know, is, is it, are, are, you, are you afraid um, that you'll fail? Well, we've all failed, but there are things that we could do. There are things that our church people can do that they never venture out. They're one place, one station, one dimensional. And to ask them to venture out, like he did for Simon, out into the deep, no, no, I can't do that. How could I do that? You need, to, you need to understand God many times asks you to do things that are improbable to, to man. And for one reason or another, sometimes it's God that's doing that. Sometimes you think you can do it, and then you fall flat on your face. I failed. Uh, I went, one time... Uh, we thought we were going to go to a place, and so we packed up and went. We got all the way out there. A guy wanted to start a church. When we got there, he said, I think we're just going to keep doing, staying with our old church. But we went 3,000 miles. So we had to turn around and go all the way back. And then you learn uh, not to be afraid, but to wait on God to, to set the table here for you and, and trust You've got to trust him. You always have to trust in his leading. Uh, even, even when you question, how can, how, can you, how can you be doing this with me? What, who am I? Like Moses, who, who am I? What am I to be you asking me to do this? Uh, when we were in, in school, in Bible school, then we joined the church. I joined the church. We both joined the church. And so we had a fellowship of people down at uh, South Miami, uh, church member's house. Pastor was there, and he asked everybody to give a testimony. Well, I'd never done that before. And so uh, I gave a testimony, and I s told them how I was, told everybody that, who there that how I was saved. And uh, after I was done, Pastor said, you know what? I think God can really use you. 
You just need to let go of the heel of your shoe. I had, I had no idea that I picked up my leg. It was holding on. It was a nervous thing that I did, you know. But uh, I wasn't afraid to do that. Lack of faith, though, it limits who the Lord Jesus Christ is and all, everything he commands of us, everything he asks of us. It, it limits that. It puts it in question. All right, number three, uh, James chapter four. James chapter four. And you probably know where we're going with this. James chapter four. This has to do with shallow and selfish prayers. Limit God as to your answers. Verse 1, for whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not <clears throat> because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. <clears throat> Many times the prayer lives are exactly there. Do this for me. Do this for me. Do that for me. Do this for my sake. It's all about me, you see? And he's saying, you, you're asking, but you're not receiving because you just want everything for you. It has nothing to do with me as, as, you know, as God. Uh, and it's important. Psalm 66 in verse 18, let's look there, if you would. Psalm 66, if you pass the book of Jeremiah, you might as well put your finger there. Psalm 66. And look at here in verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. This kind of goes along with the, the separation of fellowship. If I regard, if I condone, if I approve sin in my heart, I can pray, I can pray myself up the wall and down the wall. I can pray till the, the veins in my neck burst. The uh, Lord's not going to hear me because I'm condoning sin. I'm approving of it. And so when that happens, many times the prayers become very selfish and very shallow without any realization. If, if we as, a, as a, a local church pray together, it's not how long you pray. It's not how flowery your prayers are. It is, are you in touch with your Father in heaven in a fellowship? so that when we pray, we get answers according to his will. And that's, that's so important. Shallow and selfish prayers. Okay, here's number four. Number four, Jeremiah chapter five. Jeremiah chapter five. And I know these are Old Testament but they have great value practically in the New Testament. Jeremiah chapter five, and this number four, I didn't give you the title, a stubborn will, a resistant will, a neglectful will limits God. Look at verse 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. The story is told, and if you've heard it, I've heard it multiple times, that we made, a person was made it to heaven, they were walking through the hallways of heaven, and they came to a door that was shut. And so the person said, what's behind there? 
And I think the angel said, you don't want to know. He says, yes, I do want to know. And he opened the door and he said, wow, look at all that. He says, those are the things you could have had, but I had to withhold those from you because you wouldn't deal with your sin. We don't, sometimes we don't even think rationally uh, and spiritual, spiritually wise. Uh, chapter six, Jeremiah chapter six, in verse 16, I know we heard this one in one of the night messages with Micah. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Severely limiting God. Verse 17. Also, I set watchmen over, the, over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. They said, we will not hearken. I think the watchmen, the Old Testament sometimes could be associated with pastors in the New Testament. And how many times have a pastor told you to listen to the sounds for the trumpet? And, and by, by reaction, by lifestyle, you're saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go on with life as if the trumpet is not going to sound one day. But we know it is. But in practice, we're not going to do it. And God's limiting. It limited because you're stubborn. And we already know we're stubborn. Isaiah talks about stubborn and, and us being that way. Right? You, have to, you have to deal with that. We're supposed to be humble people. In uh, John 1, no, let's see, is there another one? 13, did I do 13? No. Jeremiah 13. Verse 10 and 11. The, this evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after others' gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people, for a name and for a praise and for a glory but they were not here. Look at where Israel is today. You know what that is? It's a buildup of getting delivered from the, in the wilderness to today. You got 2,000 years since Christ, 4,000 before the Lord came. Less than that, of course. I mean, you're dealing with thousands of years and they still not made it right with God. They will one day, but they still haven't. And he wants, this is what he wants to be for them. He will eventually, but at great cost to the Jewish people. What do you think he wants to do and for you to be? What does he think our local church should be? I hope it's not gonna be at great cost to find out because we should be a willing people not stubborn. In John chapter 1, verse 11, and he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They didn't want anything to do with him. Where are we today as a society, as a people? Islam's okay. Mohammed's okay. Satan's okay. The cults are okay. Who isn't okay? The Lord. Nothing's changed. And he came, and many of them are in, sadly, Bible-believing churches. They don't want anything to do with them. Big churches, program churches, we've got the programs. We don't need the Lord. So God extends his gifts and his directions 
and its commands and its restrictions, but we must accept them and use them or they're no good. And we limit him. The Lord Jesus Christ invites, he beseeches us to come uh, for salvation in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, whosoever will may come, and in the Christian life. I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye make your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But he doesn't force us. And as in the Old Testament, Many times, many people who profess Christ say, no, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. Revelation chapter 3. The last church in Revelation 2 and 3, the church at Laodicea. A severely compromised church. But still a church. And the Lord ends <clears throat> in verse 19. <clears throat> as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Where is he standing? At the door. Inside or outside? Outside. Where is he standing at the door of the church? Many churches outside. And he's knocking. The door of the believer is either their heart or the local church <clears throat> to fellowship with us. That has nothing to do with saving us. That has everything to do with fellowship. But we have to open the door. We have the key. The door is locked. The key is on our side. <clears throat> when you read this, and you read these, these little, these, like we could have gone probably about 15 or 20 of these, <clears throat> you have to, have to come to the realization that there is no limit to what God wants to do with us, for us, and in us, except for us getting in the way and causing the limitations. <clears throat> whatever, whatever the Lord has for us as a, as a local church, only we will put the limitation on it. In, a, in our lives, only we have put the limitations before the Lord. And we have, uh, let's be honest, we've limited what he can do. There should be no limits, ever. After what he's done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ, what more could anyone do for us than what he's done? How can we say no to him in anything? And yet... <clears throat> The reality is there are Christians who never witness. You never see them give out tracts. Never, ever. Never pray. Hardly ever make church a priority. And never read their Bibles. Never study God's word. And have no idea how limited they are. Virtual babies. Grown-up babies. We don't want to do that. So I hope this helps tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being patient with us. There's no one here that is being targeted. We're all targeted. We all have issues, problems. But in those issues and problems, you have answers. You have solutions. They're found in your word. They're found through prayer. They're found in the local church. Loyalty to it. 
They're found in giving out the gospel, being concerned for the souls of other people more than your benefit. I just pray that we'd come to the realization that there are things that we should be having, we should be receiving, but because of our limiting you, we may never see these things happen. I just pray you'd help us with the realization of who we are and who you are. That this is not a game, this is real life. And real life is life or death. Blessing or unblessing. Sorrow and pain or joy and happiness. I pray you'd dismiss us tonight with your blessing and that we would get to our places safely. Give us a good night, a good day tomorrow, and help us to end our day and start our day with you and all through the day. And we pray this in Jesus' name.